Okay, so this AP biology video is going to focus specifically on the plasma membrane and not really going to discuss transport too much or at all. We're going to look at the structure of the membrane. Okay, so when we think about this, all cells are surrounded by a plasma membrane. And if we think, well, what are the functions of a cell membrane, right? So we have protection for the cell. Uh, we have a fixed environment inside the cell that separates it from the outside, as well as regulating what can enter and leave a cell. But the question now becomes, what is a cell membrane composed of? And so a plasma membrane or a cell membrane um, is, surrounds all cells, no matter if it's a prokaryote or a eukaryote, and it separates the inside or the cytoplasm from the extracellular environment. Now, when we think about what they're made of, we have things called phospholipids. And if you remember from our unit one on lipids, and as well as I think like organic molecules, we just, we've seen phospholipids now a few times. So when we look at a phospholipid, it actually comes in two layers around the um, plasma membrane or cell membrane. Now, the words plasma membrane and cell membrane are used kind of interchangeably, so you'll hear me using both just to get you familiar with both types of phrasing. But anyway, when we look at our, our plasma membranes or our cell membranes, we see that there are two layers of phospholipids. And this is why we often see the cell membrane um, in this like structure, and it's referred to as a lipid by layer because there's two uh, layers of phospholipids. Okay, so when we look at this, uh, the inside of a cell, like the cytoplasm, is primarily water. And then the outside of a cell, the aqueous environment, is also primarily water. So what kind of chemical property would need to exist along these highlighted blue regions in order for it to happily interact with water? Right? So these regions of the phospholipid bilayer, or of the plasma membrane, need to be hydrophilic or water-loving. So when we look at a phospholipid, this phosphate group head is hydrophilic. It interacts happily with water both inside the cell as well as outside the cell. Now, when we look at phospholipids, uh, we have this molecular structure. This top part, we have our negatively charged phosphate group, which is, and, and the glycerol, which is why this top region is polar or hydrophilic. And then if we look at these fatty acid tails and remember our unit or our topic on lipids, we remember that fatty acids are nonpolar. So at the top here, we have our phosphate group head. And then at the bottom, we have fatty acid tails. The phosphate group head is hydrophilic or polar. And then the tails are hydrophobic or nonpolar. And so here we have a molecule that has both polar and nonpolar, hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions. When a molecule has both um, polar and nonpolar, we call it amphipathic. And one time I had a student say like, oh, like an amphibian, both land and water. And I loved that analogy. But anyway, let's go ahead and see um, when we look at a cell. So if a cell membrane were to exist only as a single layer of phospholipids, when there's water on the outside and water on the inside, would this work? Right? If we think deeply about those fatty acid tails, they are nonpolar. They would repel from that cytoplasm that's inside the cell. So they would like face each other rather than the, the water. So could a cell membrane be made of a single layer of phospholipids? No. Um, the fatty acid tails would repel from that aqueous uh, cytoplasmic environment. This is why the cell membrane comes in a bilayer, two layers of phospholipids. So when we talk about phospholipids, the fatty acid tails face each other and the phosphate group heads face the watery environment, both external and internal of the cell. So the outer regions of a cell membrane are polar or hydrophilic. And then that center region is nonpolar and hydrophobic. Now, these regions in a cell membrane are very important for when we discuss how molecules enter and leave a cell. So we will revisit this in the next topic as well. Um, so our question, uh, but is a cell membrane only made of lipids? No, there's actually gonna also be proteins embedded within our cell membranes. Now proteins can have up to six different functions. We will see lots of functions about 
Is that how you say it? A lot of functions of proteins embedded within the membrane throughout our year. In unit two, we'll talk about um, transport proteins, channel proteins, um, active transport like pumps. We will talk about in unit four about receptor proteins or enzymes embedded within the membrane. So we will see a variety of proteins and different jobs uh, uh, located within the cell membrane. So there's proteins there. Now, if we were to think about this, uh, what are proteins made out of, right? If you go back to unit one, we know that proteins are made out of amino acids. Now, we're also going to reflect on, well, what are the chemical properties of amino acids? So we go back, go back to topic 1.7, and we remember that amino acids can be polar. They can also be nonpolar. They also might be ionic as well and have a positive or negative charge, right? So what kind of amino acids would you find in that green highlighted area? Right? We want to think that's the region of the cell membrane or the plasma membrane or the lipid bilayer that is nonpolar. So what kind of amino acids would be in that green region of this protein? We would expect nonpolar amino acids. And if we think about this pink area of the protein, this is now interacting with a watery or aqueous environment both inside and outside of the cell. So what kind of amino acids would we find there? probably going to be polar or ionic amino acids, right, that are happy to interact with the water. So let's go ahead and look at a different view. We also go back to topic uh, 1.7, unit 1. We know that proteins are polypeptides, chains of amino acids. So here we can see a polypeptide. Um, so this squiggly line is going to represent a polypeptide embedded within the, the lipid bilayer. Now when we think about it, how would you describe the green region, uh, B right here. What kind of amino acids would be in this part of the polypeptide? Right? Hopefully you're thinking hydrophobic or non nonpolar. If we think about region A, region A, sorry, I have a question here. Which area, A or B, represents hydrophilic amino acids? Well, that's going to be region A that's in a watery, aqueous cytoplasm and external environment. So proteins, uh, so which part would repel water? B. So when we think about proteins, proteins are like the perfect macromolecule to span a membrane. So while a plasma membrane has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions, a protein can have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic monomers or amino acids. So as that protein is built, the center part, the transmembrane region that's going to be in the fatty acid area will have nonpolar amino acids, and the parts of the polypeptide in the cytoplasm or the extracellular environment will have hydrophilic amino acids or polar amino acids. Now, we also want to think about this. Will this protein ever pop out of the membrane? Will it just like, oh, I'm no longer in the membrane? No, right? Because that region B is nonpolar, it repels water. So that region B area is going to help to anchor that protein within the membrane. Okay, so uh, my next question is, membranes um, are fluid and flexible. But how fluid and flexible, right? Uh, so when we think about this, the membrane fluidity is equal to about thick <laughs> oil or thick salad dressing. If you pour like a really thick salad dressing out, um, uh, that's about the fluidity of a membrane. Now, our, we already talked about how come a protein doesn't pop out of a membrane, and that's really going to be because of those nonpolar amino acids in that transmembrane region, anchoring it in. Now, what are some other factors, though, that might influence the fluidity of a membrane? What could determine how fluid a, a membrane is? Well, going back again to unit one, talking about saturated and unsaturated fatty acids, we learned in topic 1.5 that saturated fatty acids are solid at room temperature because they pack really close together. We also learned that unsaturated fatty acids are liquid at room temperature. So if we have a cell membrane with fatty acid tails, we have two options, right? We can have saturated fatty acids or we can have unsaturated fatty acids. Now, if a cell membrane has a high concentration or a high percentage of unsaturated fatty acids, that's going to be a very fluid membrane. How will that integrity of that membrane, is it going to hold everything in? Right? On the opposite, if we have all saturated fatty acid tails, it's going to be a very thick membrane. How will diffusion happen easily? How will oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse into that cell if it's very viscous and very thick? Hmm. Right? So most cell membranes are going to have a combination of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids to help maintain fluidity. 
All right. Uh, okay. Now let's go ahead, though. I have a mystery molecule for you here. I want you to think for a second, is this mystery molecule polar or nonpolar and justify? So pause the video if you need to think. Okay, so this mystery molecule is embedded in the fatty acid region of the membrane. That's going to make this molecule a nonpolar molecule. Now, this molecule is actually cholesterol. You may have also remembered it from unit one. So if we think about it, well, what role do you think cholesterol plays in the membrane? Right? So here it's in the fatty acid region, and we were just talking about fluidity. So cholesterol's role is a, like a fluidity buffer. So an analogy I give in my class is let's say we line up 40 students, and I go through and I put orange safety cones, like roadway cones, in between like every five or six kids, I put an orange cone. And I tell the kids, okay, everyone get shoulder to shoulder. Well, the cones are in the way, and it prevents them from packing too closely together. I was everyone spread out, spread out, but they hit the cones and they can't spread out. The cones are similar to the cholesterol in a submembrane. It prevents the phospholipids from spreading too far out and becoming too fluid, but it also prevents the fatty acids, I'm sorry, the phospholipids from packing too closely together. So cholesterol acts as a fluidity buffer within the membrane. Okay, uh, so you can pause and read that if you'd like to. And now our last discussion, though, is there's other things within this membrane. Oh, I have questions. Um, do you think proteins stay fixed in their locations as this membrane is fluid and flexible? So proteins, um, do you think they're able to move vertically, like in and out of the membrane, like out and in? Or do you think they're able to move laterally, laterally or horizontally? Well, the answer is going to be B. Proteins, while they're not popping out of the membrane because of those nonpolar amino acids anchoring them in, proteins can move laterally within the, the phospholipid bilayer. Now, there's one last molecule to discuss, which you can see here. It's orange. <laughs> and these are going to be carbohydrate chains. So carbohydrate chains, we have two kinds. If the carbohydrate is attached to a protein and that's how it's anchored in the membrane, we call it a glycoprotein. If the carbohydrate chain is attached to fatty acid tails and that's how it's anchored in the membrane, we call it a glycolipid. Now, just generally in this class, we don't go into too much detail about carbohydrate chains, but they are similar to ID tags on the cell surface and it helps cells recognize each other as well as helping the immune system to establish which cells belong to you and which ones don't. So if you have like a pathogen come in, your immune system is going to notice, hey, that doesn't have the same carbohydrate chains that I'm expecting, and it knows to attack that cell. Now, in autoimmune diseases like lupus or MS or something, the immune system actually loses its ability to identify self versus non-self and actually will begin to attack its own cells, and that's an autoimmune disease. But anyway, so this here, when we look at our, let's go back, I like this picture here, the, this one. So when we look at the submembrane, we call it a fluid mosaic model because it is fluid, it's flexible, the proteins can move around, and it's a mosaic because it's made of a whole bunch of different types of macromolecules. We have all the macromolecules except for DNA here, right? We have lipids, we have proteins, and we have carbohydrates. So that is my summary of the structure of plasma membranes. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit longer than I anticipated. So hopefully it was helpful for you and great job.